Good Morning Cornerstone. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 33. Genesis 33. It's good to have you here this morning. My name is Mike Harrigan. I'm one of the elders here. And I want to start by um, thanking Dustin for already causing division in the church by saying that his ministry is the best already. He's already off to a good start, but that's okay. We'll heal from this, Dustin. That's okay. We're good. Um, Genesis 33. You know, relationships... I think would be a lot easier if if people weren't in them. Would you agree with me on that? Have you ever had this thought? Um, I think the family member that I get along with the best is my golden retriever. Has that ever happened to you before? Like, yeah, I think we have the best with the best communication skills in the house. Uh, does what I say. He knows exactly what I'm thinking, uh, and, and it kind of works that way. And <clears throat> why is that? Why is it? Because our sin natures hurt each other. And that even filters into how we treat each other, what we say to each other. What's added another layer of complexity to relationships is now, uh, it, now we can directly communicate via texting, right? And the interesting thing about texting, oh, I, I want to ask this. I, I, I couldn't wait to ask this question, okay? Because this, this intrigues me as far as communication today. Who in here prefers to text now over just directly talking to someone on a phone? Who would prefer to text? Raise your hand. Okay, that's what I expected. Just about 35, 40% of you, maybe more, now prefer to text. What's interesting about texting is you don't always get tone, right? You, you don't always uh, get the heart behind, they're just words on a screen. Most of the time they don't have vowels, right? Everything's misspelled. And we try to look at it and figure out what people are telling us. And maybe this has happened to you before, um, that somebody's been offended by, or you've been offended by something someone has told you via text. And if you're an insensitive texter like I am, um, I found a solution for you. You ready? The smiley face emoji. And nothing great. Because really, you can stick that at the end of anything, and it controls the whole, whole tone of whatever you say. You, you can be as rude as you want to, and as long as you stick that thing at the end, you're good. It covers you. Yeah, I, th I think it's in Proverbs somewhere. The smiley face emoji covers a multitude of sins. It's, you got, you got to find it. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, hey, kids, if, if you don't clean your room this weekend, I'm going to burn them to the ground and you're living outside. Smiley face emoji. <laughs> huh? That's great. Um, in the marriage relationship. Hey, honey, I meant to tell you last night that I felt like your stroganoff was a little under-seasoned. Can you do something about that? Smiley face emoji, huh? Get you out of it, right? No. Um, in business, Mr. Thompson, you really don't know what you're talking about. Smiley face emoji, it works, it works everywhere. But I heard something recently, and it kind of it turned my texting life upside down, okay? Young people are now saying that the smiley face emoji, we're overusing it, and it's coming across passive-aggressive, I don't even know how they can come to that conclusion. I mean, yeah, the only time I, I use it is to mildly ridicule people from a distance. What's passive aggressive about that? You know, um, relationships can get complicated, especially in the way we communicate. And I'm grateful that the Bible um, teaches us not just in lecture format and sermon format, although I love the heights of the Sermon on the Mount by Christ. I love sojourning through Galatians and Romans. But there's something about learning from living and the honesty that Genesis gives us about some heroes um, of our faith at the beginning and, and drawing less life lessons from them. We see their heights and depths, their successes, their failures, and how God is responding and interacting with them. And we're going to see that again here in Genesis 33. Let's read it. Genesis 33. We're going to start in verse 1. We're going to go all the way to verse 11. Genesis 33, verses 1 through 11. 
And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after, and Rachel and Joseph hindermost. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted up his eyes and, and saw the women and the children and said, Who are those with thee? And he said, The children which God graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? And he said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep thou that thou hast unto thyself. Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I have seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and he took it. This morning we're going to learn some lessons about reconciliation. Lessons about reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, the name above every name, King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet it is his life that hung on the cross for us. Our, we in our sinful state was so valuable that the king of kings hung on a cross, died and rose again. Thank you for this amazing love that you have for us. But God, you don't just offer us salvation and seal it. But Father, you also give us your word and instruct us how to live and walk with you. Will you help us to hear you this morning? Help us to be receptive to these lessons you, you offer us in the life of Jacob and Esau. Teach us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. By this point in Jacob's life, he has reached a point of, of brokenness before God. He has been reminded of God's covenant he has wrestled with God desperate now for his blessing. He has realized he, he can't scheme and swindle his way through life with every limp from his, his, his uh, hip being pulled out of joint in that all-night wrestling match. He's reminded of his, of his need for Jehovah. And as often... As it is with a case where someone has kind of recommitted their faith to the Lord, it's, it's tested immediately. So in order to understand the weight of this interaction here in Genesis 33, you really have to remember the tenuous history behind these two twins. Do you, do you recall that? Maybe you are here last week. If you want to, you can flip to a, a couple of these passages. But in Genesis 25, if you recall Esau being famished, and he just recklessly sells his birthright for Jacob to make him a, pot, uh, a, a stew. And the ever opportunistic Jacob uh, certainly uh, uh, it takes advantage of that. And then later, Jacob, with the help of his mom, uh, basically deceives, uh, well, certainly deceives Isaac and steals the blessing of the firstborn. And of course, when Esau found that, that out, he was enraged. As a matter of fact, let's look at chapter 27, if you will. Chapter 27, look at verse 41. This kind of sets the table for how miraculous of an event this is in Genesis 33. Genesis 27, look at verse 41. And Esau 
hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother. It was on. He wanted blood. He stole from me, and I'm going to get him back. At this point, Jacob has a target on his back. Rebecca, understanding the temperature of the home, sends Jacob to her family. Jacob gets married. His family grows, works for Laban. Esau and Jacob don't run into each other again during this time frame until Genesis 32. And that's where we're at. And that brings us to a point one. So if you're following along in your outline, point one. Lesson about reconciliation. Um, reconciliation must have an initiator. Reconciliation must have an initiator. <coughs> it doesn't happen by um, happenstance or accidentally. It must have an initiator. As long as I can remember the story, I always had it in my head that somehow Esau knew Jacob was coming and cut him off at the pass. Like, he came with the 400 men. It looks like an army to me. And, I mean, there, there's, there's something bad about to happen. A malicious intent from Esau's perspective. But when you research this thing and look deeply in it, that's not what happened. Esau didn't just catch up to Jacob as he was passing by. Look at chapter 32. Look at this. This is interesting. Genesis 32, verse 3. Genesis 32, verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. Remember that, land of Seir, country of Edom. That's going to, that's going to be an important point. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my lord Esau, the servant Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now, and I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Let me ask you something. Who initiated the initial contact, Esau or Jacob? Class, Jacob did. Here's what's interesting about this. If you'll pull, pull up the map, please. Okay, so see where our big obnoxious blue arrow is? That is the area where Jacob is in Genesis 32 and 33, right in that region, okay? Esau are, is not living anywhere near there, okay? So when he sent messengers ahead to Edom and Mount Seir, I want you to know where, look where Edom is. Edom is about 75 miles south. So Jacob wasn't just sending this message because he knew he was going to run into e, uh, to Esau on the way. He went out of his way to initiate the reconciliation. So then the question is why? Well, I'm sure Jacob, there was some fear. He, he didn't want to constantly be looking over his shoulder, but I think there's something bigger than that. Remember, Jacob is now trying to follow the Lord. He's going back to Canaan where he belongs, where God's called him to, he and his family, Israel. And he wanted the, the blessing of God on his life. He could not live without making this thing right with Esau. And so he, rather than just, boy, I hope he doesn't come attack me, he initiated this meeting. That's what happened. It's out of conviction. There's no way that Jacob can do this without one character trait that you recognize throughout the two chapters. And you see it more than at any other point in his life, really. And that is, you, you see a humbled Jacob. You, you see a Jacob who's willing to set himself back and beneath. And you see it in a couple different ways. If you look back at chapter 32... Look at how he articulates the letter, the, the letter. And it says, 32, 4, and he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my Lord Esau, thy servant Jacob. Do you got that? It says, My Lord Esau, thy servant Jacob. If you go look at Isaac's blessing on Esau, you know what you'll find? Esau, you're gonna serve Jacob. 
But look how this is articulated. And, and how he's dealing with Esau, he's like, hey, Esau, I'm the servant, you're the Lord. See that? So you already see him postured in the spirit of humility. He could have acted entitled. He, he could have played the legal, hey, man, that's my legal right. I got the birthright and the blessing. I, 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 you serve me, and that's how I'm going to talk to you. You don't see that with Jacob. You, you see a, a, a humbled Jacob. That's how he approached his brother. And in, in chapter 33, verse, uh, in verse 3, in chapter 33, you see how he approached Esau? It said he bowed seven times. It's like he's, he's approaching the king of England. As a matter of fact, he had his, his whole family bow before Esau too, and rightfully so. The Bible calls Esau the father of Edom. He was, he was the lord of the armies of Mount Seir. So they, they, he approached him humbly like a king. Not, hey, bro, are we cool? There is no ability to have and initiate reconciliation without humility. And a lot of times it's our pride that keeps us from taking the first step, isn't it? You hurt my feelings. You said those words. There's no reconciliation without an initiator. What good is the, the healing waters of time if no one stirs them? There are, are marriages in here that aren't in a good place. And it's just because humility has left the walls. There are families that are not whole. Young adult children leaving estranged. Simply because no one's willing to take the first step. They don't want to face the problem. Oh, surely uh, everything will be cool over time. There are resumes being sent out, not because you need to make more money or your job stinks, but it's just because you're unwilling to get things right with a coworker or a manager. Have the courage and humility, humility to initiate reconciliation. You make the first call. Hey, you're the one with the Holy Spirit. You make the first call. You send the, the text that, that organizes the meeting. You offer the unexpected invitation. Peace demands an initiator. One other thought. It's easy to rely in our family units on a chief initiator. Do you have a chief initiator at the house? Someone you just kind of lean on because you know eventually they'll be the one to make the first step. Can, can I implore all of you who lean on your humble chief initiators to keep peace in the home? You do it this time. You initiate it. Don't just lean on the tender-hearted one. You, you show the humility. You, you, you offer balance in the home and, and show your kids sensitivity by, hey, I can initiate reconciliation too. I don't just have to wait for her or vice versa. Number two. Some lessons for, about reconciliation. Number one, reconciliation demands an initiator. Number two, it often includes restitution. Reconciliation, we find, often includes restitution. Look at chapter 33, verse 8. Chapter 33, verse 8. And he said, what meanest thou by this drove which I met? And he said, these are to find grace in thy sight of my Lord. Do you, do you know what that drove is referring to, the drove there? Okay. If you, a good quick, we don't, we don't have time to look at it, but a quick cross-reference to Jot. Um, Genesis 32, verses 13 through 19. Genesis 32, verses 13 through 19. Okay? Then I want to give you a thought. Okay. I want to define what restitution is so that we know what we're talking about. So let's clarify terms. Ready? All right, restitution. Replacing something that is taken away or lost. Replacing something that is taken away or lost. That's restitution. 
and now how is it applied here in our story? Um, if you read Genesis 32, you will find that Jacob sends Esau basically a ranch. Okay? All this, this cattle and these goats, listen to this, 220 goats, 220 sheep, 30 camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, three donkeys. He divides them into sets of three and presents them in three different ways to Esau before the family gets to Esau. And that's why Esau is like, what is all this cattle? What's, what's going on? What is this for? What, I, don't, I don't need this. I know what you're thinking. Oh, well, Jacob's at it again. There he is being a little, little slimy. A little, he's, now he's bribing his brother. Here, take this stuff. Just don't kill me, right? I thought that until I read deeper into the passage. And I want you to look at the verbiage of, of Genesis 33, verse 11. I want you to see this. Here's a lesson to learn here. Genesis 33, verse 11. Take, I pray thee, look at it. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought. Let's, let's do a little rewinding. He negotiated for the birthright, but what did Jacob steal? Class, the blessing, right? Isn't it interesting that the way, the thing that Jacob, call, that Jacob calls the, this cattle, this gift, not just a gift, not just a bribe, he calls it, hey, take, take my blessing. Why? I think this was his best effort to restore the thing that he stole from Esau. At least the, the stuff, okay? Um, and, and so what was he trying to do there? He's trying to make restitutions, and what this is communicating to Esau is thorough repentance. I, I just don't, I, I'm not just doing this, you know, because I want to be safe. I'm doing this because I want to be right. And sometimes that's what, that's, that's what restitution brings, it's evidence of a repentant heart. Um, you see this in a New Testament in a story with Jesus. Uh, there was a chief publican by the name of Zacchaeus. You find the story in Luke chapter 19. He's a short guy up in the tree trying to find Jesus. Okay, Try to see Jesus over all the tall people. Publicans hated. Nobody liked them. They stole from people. They used the Roman government to do. The only great thing about being a publican was you could get rich by, by using the Roman government to, to take advantage of the Jewish people. Jesus made a beeline for him. He called him to receive him and to repent uh, and follow God. I'm going to show you two verses from that encounter, and I want you to see Zacchaeus' reaction. Okay? Look at, let's look at this from Zacchaeus. Luke 19, look, I'm going to show you verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor... And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, let's look at Jesus' response to that restoration. Okay? Verse 9. Verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. Why? Because he, Zacchaeus didn't just say, Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus. I, I, I guess I shouldn't have done that. He made things right. There was restitution as part of his reconciliation with people. And there was evidence of his repentance. It's complete and thorough. We can all offer half-hearted words. Get mom off our back. To get the pastor off our back. To get God off our back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Restitution allows there to be evidence of that, that, that reconciliation, evidence of a repentant heart. It might be financial. You might have to make something financially right. It could cost you a little bit. Or it might be uh, telling other people who was affected by your strife with that individual, making things right on the perimeter of the other people who are affected by your strife. That could be a form of restitution. It might have to be going to a funeral or a wedding or a birthday party or family get-together you weren't planning on going on. A uh, quick note. The stuff of restitution is not a substitute for reconciliation. Okay? 
So, oh man, I've kind of been an absentee dad these last three years. I guess I'll, I know, I'll go buy my son or daughter a car. That'll make things right. They'll like me now. Okay, restitution is not a substitute for reconciliation. Y'all following me? Restitution is not a substitute for reconciliation. The heart level, apology, brokenness, honesty, making things right must be done. But sometimes, not always, but sometimes there's also a need for restitution. Some lessons here about reconciliation. One, it must be initiated. Two, it includes restor- sometimes includes restoration. Number three, God transforms hearts. God transforms hearts. Look at Genesis 33, verse 4. Genesis 33, and verse 4. Look at this. It's beautiful. And Esau ran to meet him. Isn't that cool? Doesn't that remind you of the father of the prodigal son when he ran to the prodigal? He didn't just stand there. He ran to him. Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Oh, a beautiful portrait of reconciliation. From murderers to friends, a masterpiece of mercy, God transforms hearts. What's interesting is if you study this passage out, it reminds you of a a reference earlier. We flip back to 27, chapter 27. This is interesting. Chapter 27, look at verse 40. 27, 40. This is Isaac's blessing on Esau. Okay, so Isaac's talking to Esau. And by the sword shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Now, I'm not going to tell you that what happened in Genesis 33 is a fulfillment of everything that that's talking about necessarily. But I do find it interesting that when they were reconciled, one of the things that happened is they, they grabbed each other's neck. They fell on each other's neck and, and hugged it out and wept together. And what you see, you see some yokes broken there. You see the, the yoke of Esau's bitterness and anger and hatred, his, his thirst, his appetite for for revenge, all of that. God breaks all of that. And Jacob, uh, you you see all that, that guilt and that despair and that fear broken as they embraced. And God just, God just transformed this thing and brought reconciliation. God transforms hearts. Last week we were diagnosed with the fact that we need a heart transformation. That was one of the points. We need a heart transformation. The good news of this week is God transforms hearts. Aren't you glad for that? I want to show you a verse out of Proverbs. Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water he turneth it whithersoever he will. I want to share with you the testimony of a man named Joe Avila. It's a little bit of a story, but it's worth talking about surrounding this point. Um... Joe was driving down a highway in Fresno, California on a cool evening in 1992. He was drunk, but like many times, he got behind the wheel. While driving at a high speed, he ran into the side of another vehicle that was driven by a teenager named Amy Wall. Amy Wall. He ran her off the road and she died instantly. Joe fled the scene. He doesn't remember that night. He does remember the next morning when the cops found him and booked him for second-degree murder. He admits in the days following, while in, while in jail, um, he's trying to figure out a way to kill himself. He just he couldn't live with it. He's just overwhelmed by the, the, the guilt of, of, of taking a life. But during that time, a, a friend encouraged him to check into a program um, with the Salvation Army, and it's there that he found salvation in Jesus Christ. And he finally enjoyed 
the liberty that he had in Jesus Christ and understood what it meant to be reconciled to God. When he came to grips with his faith, he knew that part of, 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 try, of his side of being restored was being honest about what he did. He went to the courthouse a week later and changed his plea to guilty. The judge uh, sentenced him uh, to up to 12 years in, in uh, the California prison system. For seven and a half years, Joe was incarcerated. He, he did his best to help. He worked with the hospice patients uh, who were also in prison. He served in the prison chapel. He shared his testimonies with the inmates around him. It was also his prayer that somehow, he, he could, somehow God could reconcile him with the Wall family. He's burdened for them. He knew he devastated them. He's released January 6, 1999, and not long after that, his mentor called him and said, hey, a young man named Derek Wall wants to talk to you. It was Amy's brother. And they sat down and talked for many hours, and Derek talked about how important Amy was to their family. She had this effervescent, bubbly personality, just a joy to be around, and it broke Joe's heart. And Derek, Amy's brother, said, for many years, you, you were a monster to us. I wanted the electric chair for you. But then Derek explained how his family had been checking in on Joe's progress while in prison, doing his best to, to not only make his life better, but to impact other people. And Joe told Derek something he's waited a long time to say. Joe said, I'm really sorry for what I've done, and I hope that someday you can forgive me. And Derek forgave him at the table that night. He couldn't believe it. Later, Joe's mentor called again. This time it was Rick, Amy's father, wanted to meet with him. During that meeting, something miraculous occurred. The grieving father said, Joe, I know what you've been doing for a long time now, even when you were in prison, and I approve of it, and I want you to know you're right with me. Joe just was taken back. He couldn't believe that God was doing this work in this family. Then he met with the mom. Uniquely, with the, the meeting with the mom, she made him watch three hours of family film of Amy's life before they met. And he's just overcome with uh, the significance of, of her and such a precious life that was taken. But then Amy's mom forgave him. His relationship with the Wall family continued to grow, and both Joe and Derek, the brother, were even asked to participate at Restorative Justice Council events. At one of the events that night, Amy's father, Rick Wall, approached Joe, hugged his daughter's killer, hugged his daughter's killer and said, Joe, I love you. What force does this? And reshapes a heart this way. When Joe gives his testimony, he doesn't cry anymore about the loss of Amy, but he always weeps when he talks about being reconciled to the walls. In 1999, Joe became a prison fellowship area director. His work had contributed to the creation of hope events that share the gospel with thousands of prisoners each year. He also architected in-prison celebrate recovery programs for addicts and the Angel Tree sports camps for children of incarcerated parents. God transforms hearts. That's the hope of reconciliation. I just wonder if someone here, you've allowed the yoke of your own bitterness or skepticism to keep you from truly being reconciled to another party. They, they may not even be alive now, but it's still there. It's become part of you. Oh, I can't change them. You're right, but God can. The vo voice that spoke this universe into existence is the force that changes hearts. 
Lessons about reconciliation. It must be initiated. It includes restoration. It's offered with the belief that God transforms hearts. Here's the last point. Reconciliation is an extension of, the, of God's mercy. Reconciliation is an extension of God's mercy. Look at this again in Genesis 33, verse 11. Look at what it says. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. That Hebrew phrase, I have enough, means I, I have all. It's like J Jacob realized, hey, Esau, the reason I want us to be right is because God so desperately wanted to be right with me. And I, now I want to be right with you. That's, that's what gave him the courage to initiate this whole thing to begin with. I want to show you a verse. It's going to be on the screen, 2 Corinthians 5.18. There's two very important parts to it. It says, And all things are of God, which hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. See, Jesus was, or God was unsatisfied with, with being unreconciled with a sinful man. So he offered his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross as the only complete payment to meet God's standard of being made right. He is the Redeemer. He is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of, of the world. Maybe you walked in here today because you didn't know what else to do to be right with God. Man, I know I have this, this sin. I, I don't even, you know, there's some things I've done. I don't even feel like God can forgive me. I want you to know that, that God paid the price for you to be made right. Coming here is not what, make, what makes you right. Trusting in what he's done for you is what reconciles you. And what he's done is given his son as an offering for you. And if you are here and, and you don't have this salvation, this reconciled salvation that is offered to us, will you just meet with the Lord and say, oh God, I, I, know, I'm, I know I'm guilty. I know I'm, I'm, I'm the sinner, but I'm trusting in Jesus to save me. I want to be reconciled to you. That's why he died and rose again, to accomplish what you could not. Will you trust him this morning? But what's interesting about that verse, it says it's, it's given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So now we enjoy it. Let me show you one more passage. Mike 7, 19. Tell, tell, tell me if this doesn't inspire you to want to extend this re this reconciliation to others. I came across it, this is my reading through the Minor Prophets, Micah 7, 19. Hear these words. He will turn again. He will have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast their sin into the depths of the sea. That's what we enjoy. Isn't that great? No matter the breadth of our sin, we enjoy the reconciliation of God, and that's why we have the ability to extend it to others. Okay. So as we approach this time now, just of reflection and response, some thoughts. Don't, don't tune me out, okay? I know we're hitting. I, I know the, 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 the plane's starting to descend, but, but hear me out, please. There are some in here where God's asking you to take the first step. You, you sense the stirring. And it's at the, up to this point, it's been a fight and excuses. I just want to tell you, it's not your lost sibling's job to make the first step. It's not your unsaved coworkers. It's not the unchurched coach. You're the one with the ministry of reconciliation. And maybe during this time, you say, say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. I'm done fighting. I surrender all. I sang it. Now I'm going to mean it. If you need to pray with somebody, hey, can you pray that God would give me the courage to take the next step? We'll do it. We'll, we'll have a prayer team up here to pray with you. I know there are some believers who've experienced just recent tragedy unexpected death, cancer diagnosis, 
miscarriage after a few years of an infertility, a lost job that changed your life. And you've been blaming God for it, honestly. You're angry at him. You question, God, I thought you were in charge of everything. How can you even allow this to happen to our family? So there's now leanness in your prayer life. You're not really actively pursuing him in the word. You're less comfortable around God's people. And what we do in that scenario, you, you haven't lost your salvation, but you certainly lost the sweetness of the fellowship that you've enjoyed with your heavenly father. What we're doing in that thing is we're sending our smiley face emoji to the Lord. Here you go, Lord. That's not really my heart, but boop. Here, here, I'm at church being a good example for my kids. Boop. What inwardly, we and God are not right, even in our, in, in, in our own, as a child of his. I'm not sure why awful things happen to good people. I know every day I walk on this rock makes heaven that much sweeter. I do know the reason that you're hearing this this morning is because God's pursuing you. The reason we landed in Genesis 33 is because he's totally unsatisfied with the brokenness in the fellowship between you and him. And he's calling you home. Will you this morning, who, who, who had hidden frustration and anger towards God, will you go to God this morning and say, oh Lord, I, this hurts. I don't get it, it hurts but I'm wrapping my arms around my loving father. I'm breaking this yoke once and for all. And I love you and I trust you. Be reconciled to God. One other thought, and I, th I think we should make space for this. I wonder if there's reconciliation that needs to happen in this room. It could be um, jealousy in the youth group. And it's caused a division. It could be in the community group where somebody lands politically and all of a sudden they're not really, the families aren't hanging together. There's less freedom and sweetness in the fellowship with the community group. And somebody said something, they weren't thinking about it and there were hurt feelings and nothing's really being done about it. It could be in marriage relationships where we hurt each other, and trust me, I've been married for 24 years. We just kind of, ah, eventually it'll go away and he will feel better about me or she will feel better about me and time will just go on. Things will eventually be made right. While we're hearing from God, while the Holy Spirit is stirring within our hearts, in this room, be reconciled. We'll have some pastoral staff here. If you want us to pray with you, we'll be glad to do it. If you're wanting just to go to the prayer room, talk it out, we'll, we'll be glad to do it. If during the response time you need to, to grab a husband or a wife or a, a kid of yours and go talk out in the lobby, feel free to do that. Let reconciliation be found here. Father, we thank you for these lessons. Help us to, res to respond to your work in our hearts tenderly and honestly. And we pray in Jesus' name.